Um, if the Mass is good in and of itself, which it is by nature, this is the Mass that Pope Francis attended as a young boy growing up. Uh, why is that Mass now suddenly something that has to be taken away from people uh, after the generosity of Pope Benedict? So, no, your hermeneutic of suspicion is meaning, you know, keep a sharp eye out. That's a good way to look at things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, they might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, it's Tuesday. It's Timely Tuesday. Lively guest and I start off with an interesting topic and then talk about hot headlines affecting the church and the world. In the last segment, it's you and me sharing timely thoughts, reflecting on what we've learned today. My returning guest is someone whose work I respect uh, very much. He hosts a website called returntotradition.org. I do recommend it to you. Uh, Anthony Stein, welcome back to The Catholic Current. Well, thank you for having me on again, Father. It's appreciated. Anthony, you, recently you you did a, a video about uh, the three days of darkness, which has uh, been an enduring theme in Catholic prophecy and, and uh, approved apparitions. And when I hear three days of darkness, I think of some of my diocesan friends. That's what they refer to their annual clergy convocation as as the three <laughs> days of darkness. But it, it it's not that for 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 newbies or people who are unfamiliar. What, what, what's what's the easy entree for beginning to understand the role of the three days of darkness in Catholic prophecy? The three days of darkness in Catholic prophecy appears to be, regardless of who said it, because there are accounts of approved mystics in the, and various visionaries of the church going back to all, not quite apostolic times, but the late church fathers period of, mm -hmm. of time. It seems to be the culmination of the chastisements of the church and the world, leading to a period when uh, for three days, there will be no sunlight, no natural light will work, no artificial light will work except for your blessed candles, which people debate, should they be 100% beeswax or not? I say don't err on this. <laughs> Just go pay the extra $5 on Amazon and buy 100% beeswax candles and then and get them blessed according to Marie Julie Jehenny, the most well known of these mystics, the old rite of... Um, of uh, blessing for the candles, which is done on the on the Feast of Candlemas, which is also the Feast of Our Lady of Good Success. Not, okay. co not coincidentally, but it's the sort of the culmination of these chastisements that will lead to, if the prophecies are correct, something like three quarters of the world's population being snuffed out, both the righteous and unrighteous alike. Oh, okay. That's all right. That that's a that's a feature that I that I that I hadn't heard uh, before. What it, you know? I mean, God doesn't act simply to to show off and say, "Hey, me, look at me, look look at my power." I mean, there there's there should be. I would expect that for the three days of darkness, there's there's something didactic and there's something medicinal and ultimately something merciful. What what is the purpose of the three days of darkness? Well, it will be to essentially have be God's great reset of civilization. Everything will come to an end. This isn't the end of the world, but it would be sort of the end of the present world. This is not the second coming of our Lord. This is the end of this Masonic and, <clears throat> dare I say, satanic civilization. There will be no abortion afterwards. There will be none of none of those organized evils in pornography. None of that because the, you know, the gates of hell will be unleashed on the world. They will, you know, of the accounts, one of the more common refrains from various mystics is. When this is happening, do not answer your door, even if you hear a loved one on the other side, because it could be a demon, that these things will be out there doing what they do, and they will have no restraints except for those the homes of the righteous that God has chosen will survive. And a blessed candle is one of those uh, mechanisms that will be sort of a, a sign of that, though they also say if there's a per, even a single person not in a state of grace in the house, then no one will survive in that home. So stay close this to the seems ra ra rather <laughs> This seems rather <laughs> severe, uh, and and I imagine a, a lot of people would 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 find this alarming. Can you can you associate some some names with these various prophecies regarding the three days of darkness? Sure, uh, Marie Julie Jehenny, who was beatified, I believe, by John Paul II, who's 
One is the most well-known name. Another is Blessed Elena Aiello is another one. Let me pull up my most recent script for this so I can actually find the the uh, some of the other ones because there's a lot of less well-known people mm-hmm. involved in this because – well, that's not my more recent one. But, um, but those are the two main okay. ones. People also associate Padre Pio with it, but mm-hmm. there's a lot of debate. I have a right. video on that, but you can even tell when I'm – just giving you the, the alleged message from him that it's it's up for debate because his religious order has vehemently said most of the prophetic me- messages associated with him are not from him. Okay, but I'm also reminded that his that he also had a lot of a lot to suffer within his own religious order in his own life, and because mm-hmm. of how sensational these things sound, people might want to distance themselves from it. So I see, I see. But Marie, there's there's a good documentary about Marie Julie Jehenny that goes into in depth on I want to say Vimeo. We just look, go three days, do a search for three days of darkness, mm-hmm. and then the name Marie, and that will that should bring it right up. And it's like an hour and a half long or something. It really goes mm-hmm. into a lot of detail. She's called the Breton Mystic. She's from uh, northern France, and she gives a lot of details about remedies for that that'll be useful after the three days of darkness because afterwards, there's not going to be a lot of other people around. There's, it's not going to be, you know, civilization will reorganize itself again. And this is all supposed to happen, I think, before the arrival of the Antichrist. Like, you're going to have a period which, according to one of the messages, there will be 25 years of good harvests, which people tend to think means material plenty, because that's how people always think. Mm-hmm. But when I re- when, the first time I read that, all I could think of was what the Bible says about good harvests. Father, what, is, uh, what does the Bible mean about good harvests? Well, good harvest is ultimately a harvest of souls. Yes. It, so it's not stirring up of, in your barns. Yeah. Yeah. 25 years of, you know, the easiest period possibly since some point in, you know, in high Christendom, probably mm-hmm. when for people to achieve sanctity without the evils of the world really dragging you down. And you have 25 years of good harvests. Although I would suspect also there'll probably be a material side of that too. Okay. And then men, men will begin to forget again and probably re, it'll probably be 25 years it'll take for man to rebuild. You know, to get their modern technological order back up and running again, and then sin comes in again, reenters okay. the fold. It's and people say, "Well, I don't believe it because how can pot people who experience that forget so quickly?" Well, <laughs> I mean, how, how long did it take for Noah's sons to forget? Right. It didn't take long. Uh, no, I said, you know, I, I I know something about human history and, and human nature, starting with my own. And it seems that that we have a facility for amnesia when uh, shortly after we've received graces and, and mercies and warnings uh, as well. So it seems that what you're describing is, is kind of a, a hard reset to say, gosh, you know, at least since the time of the French Revolution, what used to be called Christendom, now we call it the West, has made a, a conscious choice to live publicly, privately, formally, and informally without Christ. And uh, the result was was a lot of bad art and a lot of dead bodies. Uh, yes. It can't continue in this direction in, indefinitely. So uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, and, and this is in the matter of private revelation, that the prophets who are talking about a three days of darkness saying that it's God's going to shake up the snow globe uh, again. Is that is that a rough yes. approximation? Yes, and there will be prelates of the church who will survive, so the church will survive and the church will continue. Mm-hmm. And it will be it, those who are not Catholic who survive will become Catholic. They, this will, okay. this will you know, scare Hades out of them, basically. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and but our modern sinful liberal order will be over. Mm-hmm. Don't be too attached to your your your. your your nation states don't be too attached to the political order because those things all die. Now, what I always tell people, though, is, yeah, you know, some prudential preparation for this is probably good, but you could be hit by a bus tomorrow. And sure. it's much more important that you're in a state of grace because you may choke on your dinner. You may have right. a heart attack. You may die in your sleep. It's better to be in a state of grace because you could meet our Lord tomorrow. Sure. Sure. And the three days of darkness, if it happens, we are talking about private revelation after all. If it mm-hmm. were to happen, may not happen for a thousand years. We don't right. really know. Right. But but ultimately, you know, uh, death comes for, for each of us and our Lord comes in glory finally. You know, when I was an undergrad, I, I spent four summers 
working for an auto insurance company. And while my friends were at the breach, I was reading thousands of accident reports every summer. So <laughs> I have a very acute sense of how things can go wrong unexpectedly. And then I spent a year as a chaplain in a level one trauma center in a major urban hospital. So I have a vivid sense of what things look like when things go really, really wrong. So life is an uncertain business, but we are certain that we will have to meet God face to face and give an account of our lives without excuses. So dying in a state of grace is job one. And I was preaching just this morning, we have to immediately surrender the illusion that we can sin safely, or as C.S. Lewis said, that we could bring souvenirs from hell in, into heaven. That's just not going to happen. And um, whatever one, our listeners think of uh, these prophecies of the three days of darkness, be absolutely certain the time for conversion, repentance, and seeking out God's grace is right now. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Anthony Stein on this timely Tuesday. Check out his website, returntotradition.org. In the next segment, we're going to be talking about rumors that are coming out of Rome. It's an important conversation. Remember, our rallying cry here at the Catholic Current is Christus Mundo, Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because our Lord says so, for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. After the broadcast today, go to the stationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Everything you need to take this conversation to your family and friends, we give to you. Together, let's take it around the world. We'll be back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTague, your daily host for The Catholic Current. Join me on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern when we welcome back author and journalist Phil Lawler. He has a lot to say about church authority and vaccine mandates. This is Must Listen Radio. That's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern on The Catholic Current, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. You're listening to The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Stay connected with the show, our guests, and topics by following the show on Twitter and Gab. Just search for The Catholic Current. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for The Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. On this timely Tuesday, my returning guest is Anthony Stein. Check out his good work at returntotradition.org. Anthony, you've been having some videos recently of rumors uh, coming out of Rome that uh, there might be another papal resignation. There might be a papal document about resignations. There might be uh, exciting things happening on the synod, on, on synodality. There might be a document on the possibility of women deaconesses, et, et cetera, et cetera. What have you been hearing? Francis is going to retire. I don't think Pope Francis would do that. Mm -hmm. But the going rumor is that he has a document forthcoming that will change the nature or perhaps clarify the nature of the office of the quote unquote Pope Emeritus mm -hmm. and that he would be retiring, that he would announce his own papal resignation shortly thereafter, probably after the first phase of the synod on synods on mm -hmm. synodality. I have a hard time following what this synod is, but it's the beginning of a two year process, which sounds mm -hmm. to me more like a council, mm -hmm. but the bishops of the world will be meeting. I believe it's this fall starting here in just a few weeks. And then mm -hmm. they will uh, then, after several meetings, will have a draft document that Francis will promulgate, and they will return back to their countries and their own dioceses and their own national bishops' conferences, and then do synod national synods where the laity participate and seek to address the concerns of the laity, which, given what the research statistics say the laity believe these days, does not fill my heart with joy to think about what could come out of this. And then afterwards, at the end, they will then reconvene in Rome in, I think, 2023 to finish this process. 
you know, there are people who, and I, that is important because this will be, could be Francis's biggest papal achievement is this giant synod for bringing the church up to date again, I guess, you know, there's, and there's a lot of rumors swirling around it because against the backdrop of that had been the German bishop synod. Mm -hmm. the, the German bishops had been having their own national synod this whole time for the last year. And they were talking about deaconesses, the possibility of formally ordaining women as deacons, the blessing of homosexual marriage, pretty much everything that we as Catholics have held on to in the past century against the pressures of the world on the moral front mm -hmm. there and, and on the bowing to what the world thinks our religion should look like. Mm -hmm. They want to essentially embrace all of it, including intercommunion for Protestants. And for a while, Francis had said, I am the Pope. Do not do this without the entire church. And they ignored him. Mm -hmm. And then about a month or two ago, he had released a document or a statement essentially giving them the go ahead, blessing what they were doing. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I, was, I wasn't surprised because I, at this point, I'm not surprised by much. Although I was surprised by Traditionis Custodis because it went further than I was expecting. <laughs> but, but we can him just for a moment in, in the context of Synod. Uh, uh, I don't like naming names, but a very prominent American churchman uh, said that, well, not all traditional Catholics, but some of them, my problem with them is they, they think that they're, they're superior to other Catholics. And that really bothers me. And I said, you know, I'm thinking that the members of the German Synod who were calling for the ordination of women and the blessing of same-sex women, which I oppose – because I'm a being of reason and a recipient of grace, don't they think they're superior to me? Why isn't this prominent church in defending himself and me against those German uh, synodal Catholics who think they're better than everyone else? So th there seems to be uh, rather selective indignation, rather selective defensiveness. But ultimately, it seems to me what we're talking about is kind of a parliamentary approach to the magisterium. It's democratizing the church. This right. was something that we had heard whispers about for decades that some of the more, we'll call them the innovative, the more modernists, hyper-modernists mm -hmm. within, you know, as a certain faction among the Roman mm -hmm. Curia and among the bishops around the world, they had wanted to bring the papacy down to the level of the bishops. Essentially, the Eastern Orthodox model of running the church, except you have a pope who is your symbol of unity, and he is the first among equals, but that's it. And that would almost do this. And it's so strange to have that happening under Pope Francis because say what you want about him. Like a lot of people don't like him at all. Can't think of a single positive thing to say about him. But I actually do kind of like his strong arm nature. Mm -hmm. You would need to have a strong arm to govern the church today. You would have to. Sure. I'm just not wild about how, what he does with that strong armed nature. Mm -hmm. But if we get a, you know, a, a very pious, traditionally minded pope in the near future – please, Lord, <laughs> if that were mm -hmm. to happen, he would have to be as much of a strong arm, if not more than Francis. I, I remember, I, gosh, this is when I was first ordained, so it's almost 25 years ago now, attending some conference about, you know, reimagining the future of the church or something like that. And what was recommended was that following the Orthodox model, you had regional patriarchs and then the uh, the Pope would be kind of the Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, kind of a first among equals. And effectively, you'd fracture the church by setting up national churches. Uh, and I, I, I just don't see how those movements are, are of God, uh, because it would be an absolute break with what the church has always thought and taught about herself uh, across the right. ages. So I find this profoundly alarming. The advocates, don't they read history? They do, but I think most of these advocates, they look to how what, – what the fruits have been in the Anglican Church, in the Anglican Communion, what the fruits of that have been, adopting an Anglican way model of running the church. Because that's what it really reminds me of is Anglicanism, mm -hmm. and I think they like the fruits they've seen. They like the embrace of homosexuality. They like women clergy. They just, I believe, just had their first women bishop, I think. Um, oh, no, the, the, the Anglicans like, have had women bishops for years. But, but, but I, mean, I mean, demographically, I mean, certainly in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, the, the Anglican church is, is in a death spiral. It's, it, it, it's an irrelevance. Well, they, I mean, yeah, but they don't care about that, do they? I mean, the, I, well, uh, I, you know, a, a no, lot of... No one wakes up in the morning saying, gosh, I wonder what the Archbishop of Canterbury said today. 
that does anybody <laughs> do that? I'm mean, no, no disrespect, but I mean, realistically. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know many Anglicans, but I don't think I've, I don't, I see a lot of Protestants on social media, mm-hmm. a lot of Anglicans, like a lot of what they call calling themselves traditional high church Anglicans, and I never see them, you know, tweeting or posting about the, uh, you know, the goings on of Justin Welby. Right, or, or or how the Anglican communion is progressing from glory to glory with <laughs> You know, gospel cru- crusade. So, well, that, all right. So that 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 is that is profoundly uh, c- concerning. Um, you you recently had had a video where you talked about there's some rumors that there's going to be yet another commission on on women as deacons. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's beginning here just in the next couple of weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, is it is the commission convening because they haven't gotten the right answer yet? I suspect as much because I believe they've met twice before and kept coming right. back with the same answer of deaconesses were there to help the bishop do things that were not appropriate for men to help with. Like the, you know, examining a woman who had a claim about being physically abused by her husband or helping with right. full immersion baptisms or things like that. Right. It wasn't an ordained office. It was not a sacramental office. Right. I would actually suggest that the, the that if you go to your typical diocesan parish, the woman who sits on the parish council probably has more, way more authority in that parish community than any deaconess ever had mm-hmm. in the history mm-hmm. of the church. Right, and, and and it is. I mean, the the historical record is is indisputable that that it it, it was not a share in the sacrament of order. There, right. So we we have to be. I mean, there was there was nothing ever. It, it wasn't it wasn't a sacrament uh, at all. So it seems to be kind of a, a sleight of hand with the historical record as well. So that, that is, um, all right, that, that, that is very, very disturbing. Have you heard any good news coming out of Rome these days? I always tell people if there was good news, I would report on it. (laughs) (laughs) I would happily report on it. I think the last really good news video I did was about the FSSP and the SSPX and some other groups, their ordination numbers, the number of men that they had elevated to the, the, to the priesthood, but that was a while ago. Okay. Can, if can, people can you are give us a sense if, of what those numbers are? Well, this was two years ago. They okay. were, but they had more, but they had ordained more men than a, than a large diocese in the United States had each. Okay. Wow. But the next year they were they were they didn't have that many men, so <laughs> I didn't report on it. No, the, my, um, my understanding is that in in France, uh, the the majority of ordinations these days are with traditional communities. That is what I had heard as well, and I suspect okay. that has that is something to do with the um, push to tightly rein in the traditional liturgy and to sunset it because that's what traditionus custodis did right but a sunset right. it didn't give a date for it right but francis's accompanying letter he said point blank that it was you know the aim was to welcome back the, for the eventual return to the right. unique ex- sole expression of the roman right meaning the new mass right which is interesting because he has he swept away the use of terms like extraordinary form and ordinary form right and it seems like he swept away the hermeneutic of continuity which i don't think they understood the implications of that because well, there yeah, are radicals but, within tradi- there are radicals within the traditionalist movement who are pointing now saying look even Fr- pope francis agrees with us <laughs> that there's no right. hermeneutic of continuity Whatever happened to that phrase, the reform of the reform? My understanding was that 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 phrase doesn't enjoy favor in Rome these days. Is that correct? Now, that seems to be correct. The reform of the reform that I keep hearing about is new variations of the liturgy stylized for far-flung places around the world. We saw the first hint of that really with the Amazonian rite, although predating that was apparently like the Zairean use of the mm-hmm. Roman liturgy. Um, I just saw today that there is now a um, – what is the proper name for the gypsies? I can't remember the proper name for them. But oh, there the, is a the, – The Romani? Yes, okay. the Romani. So there is now apparently like a Romani rite of the Roman okay. rite of mass. <laughs> so oh, okay. we're, we're – we're, we're, yeah, that, that seems to be where things are going, which then goes back to the synodality thing. Remember, where did the – do you know where the National Bishops' Conferences came from, at least um, in the United States? Oh, that that was done on on an industrial basis. I think it was General Motors and IBM were called in as consultants. Well, the in the United States, the National Bishops Conference was done by Cardinal uh, um, Cardinal Bernadin. Okay. He was the one who really spearheaded the creation of what was then called the National Catholic Bishops Conference. Right, it's right. now the USCCB. Okay, and that model is everywhere now. 
Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. why you, um, the divorced and civilly remarried can receive Holy Communion in one country, but not in another. Hmm. It's why you have the Costa Rican National Bishops Conference released a statement banning the traditional liturgy entirely in their country. And then punishing a priest for trying to say the traditional literature or trying to say the new mass with Tridentine elements in it in right. Latin, ad orientum, altar rails, all of it. They punished him for it, too. You mean like the council called for? Oops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah, the, right. Oh, my. Which is Friends. why I find it interesting. This is why I find it funny that Traditionis Custoda says we should have uh, the, the new mass should be is the will of the council. I've been wow. to one mass that looked like that. <laughs> Friends, and we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. In the next segment, we're going to talk about the motu proprio affecting the traditional Latin mass and how that's being received in the United States. After the broadcast today, go to the stationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Follow on your favorite channel, grab the audio, write a five-star review. We need to attract the attention of the algorithm so these conversations get the the attention they deserve. Together, let's take it around the world. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is the Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. It's Timely Tuesday. Lively guest and I talk about hot headlines affecting the church and the world. You'll want to stay with us for the whole hour, because in the last segment, it's you and me sharing timely thoughts, reflecting on what we heard today. My returning guest is Anthony Stein. He heads up the very fine website, returntotradition.org. Please do check out his, his good work. Anthony, let, let's talk about the, the, the motu proprio re- restricting the, the traditional Latin Mass, and let's focus on how it's being received in the United States. What, what have you been observing? Um, some bishops moved with lightning speed to severely restrict or even eliminate all Latin Mass options in their diocese. Others seem to have ignored it completely. And still others have said we're going – essentially we need to study the issue, study the document to impl- – and so it is to better understand how to implement it, which for some of them probably is just a stalling tactic. But for others, because many people cheered when they saw those kind of responses because they thought the same thing I did. But then a few of the bishops, and I can't remember the names of any of the particular who did, but one just did this recently, came out with some of the most draconian interpretations of the Mm -hmm. document after just, you know, the the day of the release or the day after Mm -hmm. saying that they needed to wait and see. So you're seeing across the board different sorts of implementations. Um, My own diocese, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And the – I. I think that's going to be the status quo for a lot of places. Most famously is San Francisco under Archbishop Corte Leone, mm-hmm, who mm-hmm. had been planning to expand the Latin Mass anyway in his diocese and proceeded to do that, which is fine. Right. He, he'll, he'll be officiating at a solemn high pontifical mass on, on the feast day of Blessed Carl of Austria, which is about as traditional as, as, you, as you, you can possibly get. Um, you know, I, I've, I've read through the document and, you know, I, I'm an academic, I'm, I'm a scholar. It's just not well written. If if, if you had to implement it, you know, for example, you know, the uh, masses these masses shouldn't be held uh, at, in, in in parish churches. Well, then where are you going to have them? Uh, it seemed it seemed to to be rushed and not well executed, and not put together by people who who really did their homework. So that, and this is just the academic in me looking at it. What, what, what do you think is is driving what can only be described as an animosity towards the the usus antiquior, the the the, the mass as as it was known prior to say nineteen sixty five? 
I think what has finally conserved the, uh, caused this action was, frankly, the growth of the tr- of traditional parishes. Anybody who has visited a traditional uh, traditional Latin Mass parish, whether it's an SSPX or FSSP or most diocesan traditional Latin Mass, doesn't matter where you go, you're going to notice a few things. And the first thing you're going to notice is the great number of small children that are there. Mm-hmm. How the average age there skews 20 to 30 years lower than your typical new mass parish, your typical mm-hmm. just diocesan parish. And I didn't mm-hmm. believe that at first either until I started going to the Latin Mass, mm-hmm. and then I noticed it. That has to concern them because they know as that the changes that they implemented with the most radical interpretation possible of those changes are essentially – hanging in the balance when you look at the time frame we're not talking about here mm-hmm. 20 years from now how many of the members of the hierarchy of, of the most hyper modernist variety how many of them are going to even be alive anymore in 20 years mm-hmm. not many of them that has to concern them okay. there was a cardinal i think it was cardinal peril and the cardinal secretary of state had said just weeks before them before traditionis custodis came out that they needed to end the latin mass forever so that has to concern them they have to be aware of this. There are people who make it sound like it's, you know, Catholic YouTubers like myself or Taylor Marshall or others that cause them to act. I'm, I've been skeptical of that. But mm-hmm. then I started seeing like things online on social media from th- these figures in the church who would know that who are connected to the Roman Curia that no, they actually are concerned about that, which I blows my mind, to be honest with you. Sure, <laughs> but, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think they see that there are soft revolution uh, Mm -hmm. at the council is in danger because these parishes are growing and a lot of the diocesan sort of mainline parishes are not my they there's a there's a parish two minutes from my house i go to confession there sometimes and i right after easter or no it's right after it's right at um all saints day they'll put a banner up of all the names of the people who passed away Mm -hmm. and it's usually pretty long Mm mm-hmm and they're, they'll usually also publish a name, write a list of the names during Holy Week of the people in their RCIA program, and it's always really short. And yes, there are births and baptisms and things, but sure. I, I, I can do math, and sure. I, if sure. I can do it, they can too. Well, you know, if you go to to the to the directories of uh, adult converts, um, you know, you, you'll see that the high water mark for adult converts for for Catholics in the United States was about 1964. And and it's it's been downward uh, ever since. And you know, Mark Stein said the future belongs to those who show up. And and I think uh, a business as usual approach, the idea of Our Lady Help of Suburbia, is always going to be available as the locus for the sacramental drive-through ATM. Uh, that paradigm was in a death spiral financially and demographically even before the COVID interruption began. And I think it, it was it was a body blow. So I think what we've been living with, what we're familiar with uh, for decades, that was teetering. And, and it's it's really wobbly now uh, un, under COVID. And as I said, you know, I've I've been to those parishes where there's there's lots of young people. And, you know, when, when I do baptisms in, in Latin, it's not obvious who whose turn it is to be baptized because there are so many young couples there with babies. Uh, one would think that would be a, a hopeful sign. Uh, apparently, it hasn't been read that way. I know, Anthony, in some of your videos, you've been alluding to uh, some of the heads of the traditional communities being called to Rome. I think the, the head of the, F, if I read your article correctly, the head of the fraternity, St. Peter, is asking uh, for, for public prayers and intercession and, and, and a living rosary. Can, can you tell us about what might be going on with, with that, please? Yes, the um, FSSP have and the Institute of Christ the King Sovereign Priest, and I would assume the others that are not as well known in the United States, mm-hmm. are being are going to Rome. And I'm going to say this carefully because formally the FSSP have denied that they're being summoned. Mm-hmm. But then they put out a request from to towards the um, directed at the confraternity for the Society of Saint Peter. Mm-hmm. That's the lay that's the lay order, the lay mm-hmm. the, the lay society, sort of a third order, I would guess, mm-hmm. asking for them to um, fill out a pray, a, go online and fill out this rosary schedule so they could mm-hmm. have 8,000 rosaries, a rosary being prayed constantly, mm-hmm. basically in the month of September for this meeting that's happening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and I have to wonder because today it came out that Francis was meeting 
the Pope Francis was meeting with um, Archbishop Roach and another man whose name I has slips in my mind now, but they are the two the heads of the two dicasteries that would be in charge of de, um, essentially implementing traditionis custodis mm-hmm. and getting you know facilitating the return of traditional Catholics to the sole expression of the Roman right. Makes you wonder about all the other, um, by the way, the, all the other expressions of the Roman right. Well, well you know, of, the, the, the Anglican use most recently, but you know the the, the Ambrosian right, the Dominican right. I, mm-hmm. the, the, the numerous the, others. Yeah, do, do they not count? Do they disappear or were they overlooked? I, this is why it's people wonder about you know who who wrote this document because it wasn't penned to the best. But there are a lot of rumors swirling, and also take them with a grain of salt. But the sources I heard this from turned out to be right about Traditionis Custodis. If anything, they sort of lowballed the estimate of its impact. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the rumors is that they're going to um, put a sunset on the existence of traditional seminaries for the FSSP and other groups. Oh, yeah. Think about that for a second. You you can tell that at that point it becomes undeniable that it's about ending the traditional liturgy. Um, but the the and I would believe that would be done under the congregation for the clergy, which is the head, which is one of the the new head of that is one of the men who had an audience with Pope Francis today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, uh, well, that that's because I, uh, I I I know a um, from my view a, a young man who was applying to the fraternity, and they said, "Hey, you know, you're you're thirty five. You know, we've got guys 18, 19 years old waiting to get in. We'll get more years of service out of them. And, and when you're younger, you're, you're more formable. Um, I, I don't know a lot of diocesan seminaries, uh, you know, in, in the new right here saying, gosh, we're so full. We're only taking younger men right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So, well, God, I, <laughs> I really hope your sources are wrong about that because that, that would be – thoroughly disturbing to i want to be case. wrong so badly about all of this right right i yeah that's oh my goodness that's 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 desperately uh d- disheartening and then i i have to believe that there are some folks who say gosh this all sounds like very confusing catholic in, in inside baseball and there are people who tell me in so many words well father isn't it just the case that the new mass is just the old mass translated into english and facing the people it's definitely not the same um, oh, okay. It's not just a language issue that you can go to a Novus Ordo new mass in Latin, mm-hmm. but the traditional Latin mass is just, is fundamentally different than the mass promulgated by Paul VI. And there's a great documentary you can watch on YouTube, the first part of it anyway. I don't know when the second part's coming out, but it's called Mass of the Ages. Oh, yes. Look that up on YouTube, and it goes into some of the details, including mm-hmm. how many signs of the cross – there are in the traditional liturgy verse and how many times the priest kisses the altar in the traditional liturgy versus in the new mass and what it's ontological meaning sort of like metaphysical worldview mm-hmm. of the role of the priest is and the nature of what is happening at the mass and how it's different at the two liturgies. Then for the record, I'm not saying you do not get a valid Eucharist right. at the new mass. I do not, I do not say that I have been to mm-hmm. the new mass if I if I was needing extreme unction and viaticum, and it was a, no, a priest who says the Novus Ordo, if if he knew how to give me the apostolic pardon, I would hope so that he'd be able to do mm-hmm. that for me. But I would take the I would receive the Eucharist from him after he heard my confession. Okay, okay. so all right, so I, you know, I I appreciate that because I I think there are a lot of folks who who just aren't well informed. I mean, I you know, when I was in high school in the seventies, I was told, "Oh, you're so fortunate that you didn't have that horrible old mass because that was just a random collection of medieval irrelevancies." And so, I'm fourteen years old. I I don't know any better. And then you start to read what Thomas Aquinas was saying as he walked you through the Roman canon, line by line, gesture by gesture. And that was in the 13th century. So this knowledge has been around for a while. So I, I think there are a lot of people who who don't know what they don't know uh, re- regarding uh, liturgical history and make claims that are are, are really hard to uh, to to justify. Anthony, we, we've got about a minute left. Can you give a teaser of some of the projects you're working on? What we can look forward to hearing from you in the future. Yes. If you've heard about Our Lady of Good Success, I have been doing some research on the proper name of Our Lady of Good Success, which is translates from Spanish to Our Lady of the Good Event of the Purification. 
a remarkably different name than the common right. one we know. And I have documented documented proof that that is actually her name from the nuns who who uh, uh, well they who run her shrine in Quito, Ecuador. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be working on that. And I am going to be working on a, another We Were Warned video soon about my or about the warnings of a schism in the church. Interesting. More fun, okay. more spiritually uplifting, I'm sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I always refer to myself on the air as a dark, brooding, melancholic Irishman with an apocalyptic imagination. So I, 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 I think that somehow we, we, we share some, some spiritual genetics. Uh, Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition.org. God bless your good work. I look forward to our next conversation. God bless you, Father, and thank you again. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTague. Stay with us. Coming up, it's just you and me with timely thoughts reflecting on what we've heard today. After the broadcast today, go to the stationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Be part of the conversation by following us on Gab. That's G-A-B dot com. The channel is The Catholic Current. Everything you need to take this conversation to your family and friends, we give to you. Together, we really can take it around the world. We certainly cannot do it without you. Let's get busy. We'll be back in just two minutes. Stay with us. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTigg, your daily host for The Catholic Current. Join me on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern for an important message in this time of crisis. I will ask the question, who needs prophecy? The answer might surprise you. We'll wrap up the day with weekend readiness when I will review the headlines of the week in light of the upcoming Sunday scriptures so that you can be all prayed up for Sunday Mass. That's Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern on The Catholic Current, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. It's Timely Tuesday. In the last segment, it's just you and me reflecting on what we heard earlier in the program. If you're just joining us, you should definitely go to your favorite podcast platform and get the whole audio for today. My returning guest was Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. We talked about the three days of darkness in Catholic prophecy, and then we went on to take a look at what's happening in the church and the world. Uh, Friends, I say very often, I refer to myself only partly tongue-in-cheek, that I'm a dark, brooding, melancholic Irishman with an apocalyptic imagination. And, you know, that, uh, that protects me from false enthusiasms, protects me from being glib and giddy and facile, but it can also dim my vision and make me miss out on graces. And I think, too, though, we have to be very clear about the world that we live in. This world that we live in is not our home. It's something that cannot last. It is a preparation for eternity. An eternity, please, fulfilling God's plan for us, which is to delight for him forever in the happiness of heaven. And because we're sinful and because we're forgetful and because we have to be reminded continually to repent, God gives us nudges and shoves and, and pokes and prods. Uh, I want to read to you an excerpt from uh, the, the Imitation of Christ, that great classic by Thomas Akempis, which St. Ignatius Loyola spoke of as the partridge of spiritual books, because partridge was a great delicacy in his culture. But let me read a few lines, comment and read a few lines again. This is from The Imitation of Christ. Thomas Akempis writes, speaking to God, You thunder your judgments upon me, O Lord. You shake all my bones with fear and dread, and my soul becomes severely frightened. I am bewildered when I realize that even the heavens are not pure in your sight. 
The author goes on to say, If you discovered iniquity in the angels and did not spare them, what will become of me? The stars fall from heaven, and I mere dust. What should I expect? Those whose work seemed praiseworthy fell to the depths, and I have seen those who once were fed with the bread of angels take comfort in the husks of swine. Let me stop here for a moment, reading from The Imitation of Christ. I, I think we recognize ourselves and those around us in our time in these words from the early Middle Ages. The Kempis goes on to say, There is no holiness where you have withdrawn your hand, O Lord, no profitable wisdom if you cease to rule over it, no helpful strength if you cease to preserve it. If you forsake us, we sink and perish, but if you visit us, we rise up and live again. We are unstable, but you make us firm. We grow cool, but you inflame us. He's confessing the need that we all know in our more honest moments, that we finite fallen creatures are unreliable. And what the world, the flesh, and the devil offer us to distract us from that awful fact, that doesn't last. He goes on to say in this chapter, The Imitation of Christ, All superficial glory has been swallowed up in the depths of your judgment upon me. What is all flesh in your sight? Can the clay be glorified in opposition to its maker? So he's asking us, why do we resist God? Why do we refuse to cooperate with the one who would save us? Why do we uh, ride that roller coaster of history? History, as William Shakespeare said, is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Why resort to empty talk and empty pleasures and empty treasures when we can have fullness? So he ends the paragraph this way. The Kempis asks in this section of the Imitation of Christ, How can anyone be stirred by empty talk if his heart is subject in the truth to God? If man is subject to truth, possession of the whole world cannot swell him with pride, nor will he be swayed by the flattery of his admirers if he has established all his trust in God. For those who do nothing but talk amount to nothing. They fail with the din of words, but the truth of the Lord endures forever. And friends, in our changing and manic times, our fast-paced craziness, I want us to reflect on that today. Bring that to prayer. Bring that to conversation with your loved ones. The truth of the Lord endures forever. And the truth of the Lord is this. God alone is sovereign. God alone, by his character, reveals what is truly good and what is truly evil. God alone is worthy of worship, and God alone is sufficient for the human heart. We are made not just to know true things, to enjoy beautiful things, to delight in good things. We are meant for truth itself beauty itself, goodness itself. Our hearts are immaterial. They, they can be infinitely filled. There's no such thing as a soul that is too full. And so, so much of what people worship and run after and fight over and lust for and kill for and sell their bodies for and sell their souls for not only does it not last, it doesn't satisfy. If you are on this earth in any circumstance, be sure that you can not ever honestly say, it doesn't get any better than this. Because we can all imagine something better. And God, because he is so good, because he is so holy, wise, and loving, and provident, wants for his creatures, those made in his image and likeness, he wants the best for them, and he knows that the best for his creatures is himself. God rushes at us, eager to have us share in his joy. Remember, though, that to do that, to, to wear the crown, we first have to carry the cross. Now, I can speak glibly of carrying a cross because uh, I slept indoors last night. Uh, I ate this morning. I was able to offer Mass in public. I'm going to eat again today. 
and I'm almost certainly going to sleep indoors tonight, and I have indoor plumbing. I'm doing better than most of the world right now, and indeed most of human history. So when I talk about taking up a cross, please, please forgive me. There are people suffering martyrdom as we speak. There are people being tortured and brutalized for the faith right now. And there are people who are having their good consciences hammered by the powers and principalities of this world. So when I talk up taking up the cross of Christ, I'm pointing to Christ and to the saints and not to my own good example. I am a weak sinner who has to work out his salvation in fear and trembling. Nonetheless, by our baptism, by our confirmation, by our participation in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, by the reception of Holy Communion, we know that God has given us everything we need for salvation, for victory, for joy, and for glory. It is a frightening time, it is a confusing time, it is a painful time, but it does not have to become a time in which we are lost. Christ does not stop speaking, he does not stop teaching, and he will never, ever stop reigning. Invoke the authority of Christ the King in this moment. Pray his blessing upon yourself and your loved ones and those in need. And let's live to fight another day, as long as God wills it. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTague, your host here every day at the Catholic Current. Join us tomorrow. We welcome back Philip Lawler, editor of Catholic World News, writer and journalist. We're going to be talking about the misuse of church authority in relation to vaccination. It's a very important topic. Please do not miss that. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Take this conversation to your family and friends, and together we'll take it around the world. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may mighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace, and please do pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross.com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. Please prayerfully consider donating at the Station of the Cross.com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.